We are continuing chapter 13 and we left off at verse 17. So we continue from verse 18 onwards. Quick revision. This chapter 13 is about Kshetra Kshetra Jaya Vibhag Yoga, that is the distinction between the knower and the known. And here Bhagavad Gita and Sri Krishna clarify that there is an observer, there is a witness who knows, who experiences and everything else is the known or the field. We described in the earlier part of this chapter the, the known or the prakriti or the products of it and we briefly touched upon the knower. Now we continue. Verse 18 That light of lights is said to be beyond darkness. The knowledge, yet the object of knowledge, the goal of knowledge, it is established in the heart of all. Thus briefly I have stated the field as well as knowledge and the objects of knowledge. Knowing this, my devotee becomes ready for becoming me. Know the primordial nature, Prakriti, as well as the conscious principle, Purusha, both to be beginningless. Know the gunas as well as the products, Vikaras, to be born of Prakriti. Prakriti, it is, is said to be the cause in the matter of effect, instrument and agency. Purusha is said to be the cause in a perception of pleasures and pains. The light of light is pure consciousness. To understand these verses, we need to have a quicker sort of an overview or a recapitulation of the tattvas. We had briefly touched upon the tattvas the last time. Tattva means elements or qualities. Just as a physicist has studied and analyzed nature and the world around and come to the conclusion that the world is made up of different elements. These elements themselves are made up of atoms, protons, electrons and they have studied this and this science, modern science, is known as physics. Similarly, the ancients studied nature and the world around and also analyzed it. Their science or metaphysics as it is called is Samkhya. And in Samkhya one says that all of the world is made up of Consciousness. Everything is consciousness and originates from consciousness. When it begins to manifest, we make a distinction between Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha is that experiencer, is that light, and Prakriti is matter. It is manifested in a grosser form. It doesn't have consciousness in the same quality as the knower. It is heavier, it's darker, it's grosser. And these have, this, this Prakriti has got gunas, they're known as, gunas also means quality, three main qualities. Just like a physicist says that every atom 
is made up of a nucleus, protons, electrons and neutrons. Similarly, Samkhya metaphysics says all of Prakriti is made up of Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. These are the three qualities. Here, these verses establish that the knower and the knowables are related, they are connected, they are not separate or cut off. One, that is the knower, is observing the knowables, the field knower, the, the body bearer is experiencing the body and the world around. So these two go together. In this way, Prakriti is the cause of experiences and the knower, Purusha, is the one who perceives these or observes these or witnesses this in the form of pleasure or pain. Verses 22 and 23 are along the same lines, so we simply continue. The conscious spirit Purusha, only dwelling within Prakriti, perceives the Prakriti bound Gunas. The cause of his birth is the good and the bad bodies in his connection with the Gunas. Close observer, consenter, bearer, an experiencer is a great sovereign. The Supreme Spirit in this body is also called Supreme Self or Param Atman. So these verses sum up what we have already learned in the earlier verses that Prakruti is perceived by Purusha and is Purusha is bound by these gunas. And these gunas are the cause of birth, while Purusha remains an observer or experiencer. And this Purusha, we are using a Samkhya term here, is also known in Advaita as Paramatman, the universal self. These verses are slightly technical. It's, it's pretty okay if you don't understand everything. You don't have to at this point. But as long as you get the basic message in which which is that there is a witness who experiences or witnesses everything and everything else basically is body or world. It's all a part of Prakriti. Stop me anytime if you have a question or you have a doubt, or you want to share something. As I said, I understand that these few verses are slightly technical here, so don't let it bother you too much. Verses 24 to 26. He who knows the conscious spirit Purusha as well as the primordial nature Prakriti together with the Gunas 
even though operating in every way, he is not bound again. Some see the self by the self, within the self, through meditation, others by Sankhya or by yoga, and yet others by the yoga of action. Others, not knowing thus, worship upon hearing from others. They too intend upon learning from others, yet certainly conquer death. The one who has direct experience or insight that Purusha operates together with Prakriti, is united, who knows both, understands both, as well as the oneness, he is not bound. He is merely witnessing. He is not bound. He is not lost in the waves of gunas. The gunas come in waves. Sometimes sattva is more dominant. Sometimes rajas is more dominant. Sometimes tamas is more dominant. So these keep coming in waves. But the witness is only observing. He's not bound by them. He doesn't get lost in that rajasic mood. He doesn't get lost in the tamasic mood. He's witnessing. And to do this is possible through different paths. Some have attained this through understanding of Sankhya. Some have done it through Raja or through meditation, which is known also as Raja Yoga. Others follow the path of karma. They try to live in the world yet above successfully. Those who are not following any of these paths, have not had any experience like this, they may have heard of it from others. They have heard about it from the scriptures, from wise men or women, from saints, sages. And having heard it, eventually they too will certainly conquer death Well, that understanding is integrated in their lives. That's why it says it will happen. It doesn't say, of course, immediately or when. It's a. It's not a fast uh, track path. There are certain paths that are speedy, and others that are mild. So, worship is, is not a speedy path. So, this is the aspect of, the more technical aspect of the Tattvas of Purush and Prakriti. Verses 27 and 28. So long as any entities moving or unmoving are born, know that to be through the most union of the field and the field lower, O bull among Bharatas, dwelling alike in all beings, the supreme sovereign, not perishing among the perishing things, he who sees him, he truly sees. The moment there is a birth, a soul acquires a body. That is the union of the field and the field knower. This means that Purush and Prakriti have come together. This world exists only because of the union of Purusha and Prakriti. When the two come together, 
the world is present. If there is a body, a dead body, it is dead matter. But in the presence of consciousness, it becomes alive. And so, in Tantravan says, without Shakti, even Shiva becomes a Shava. Shava is a corpse. So even Shiva becomes a corpse without Shakti or consciousness. So the two are married together and their marriage brings about this world. The moment they separate from each other, there is a distinction taking place. In a sense it is V-yoga, not a union but a disunion of Purusha and Prakriti. When that occurs, for the first time you see the world around you with different eyes. And suddenly, the one who is seeing is Purusha, he's the observer, he's not clouded through the darkness of his own mind and body and all the nuevels, the field around him. This is a very important quality that when Prakriti is in the presence of Purusha, there's life, there's light. It's like the moon is dark, but when the sunlight is reflected on it, there's light, you see the moon. So a body would be dead matter, but Proximity of Purusha makes it alive and conscious. We will understand more of this in the following verses. Twenty-nine. Seeing the Lord dwelling in everyone equally, one does not violate the self by the self. Thereby, he reaches the supreme state. When can you see the Lord in everyone? We all know, theoretically, that there is consciousness in everyone. There is Atman in everyone. But that is mere intellectual knowledge. We are so hypnotized by the names and the forms known as Nama Rupa. Nama Rupa means names and forms. So I see that some of you are in this discussion here on the Bhagavad Gita and you have a name. So I see Survi, I see Balaji, I see Debbie. There's a name. You also have a form. So in my mind, I can see Survi, I can see Balaji. There is a form to it, to these names. And I can relate to that name and to that form. If you look around you, everything has a form. And mostly it has a name. If you're sitting at a chair on a chair, you see the chair has a form. It's got a name. It's called chair. You give it a name. If 
you're sitting at a table then it also has a certain form and this form even though the table may be of different kinds or the chairs may be of different kinds is a certain form so that everybody would recognize this as a table and chair maybe the chair is very simple the chair could be very fancy it could be like a throne it could be like a very comfortable sofa armchair it could be a very minimalistic uh, kind of chair but all the same you recognize that form it's a chair and then it has that name chair same with the table it could be a very big table it could be a small table it could be a, f a table with four legs or it could be a table which is you know um, covered on all sides and uh, or it has a one kind of a pillar thing in the middle it's kind of a round table and not square or not rectangle so there are different shapes there but all the same you recognize that form as a table and you give it a name you call it table everything around us has these names and forms and we are so caught up in these names and forms that you lose that something which makes it equal. So you see different people. Yet, what is common in all these different people? Somebody comes from India, somebody from Australia, somebody from Germany. They all look different. They have different forms, they have different names. But yet there's something common. They're all human beings. They all breathe, they all have feelings, they all have emotions, and they all are very conscious, they have consciousness. And when we stop seeing the forms and the names which help us to distinguish between these people and start seeing the similarities in them, then we come in closer to that part that is in all of us, which is the same in all of us. Traditionally, the example that is used is always of gold. You have a gold necklace, you have a gold chain, you have a gold ring. All different forms and different names. But put them in the fire, burn them in the deep fire, a very hot fire, and they melt. And what do you have? gold. They are all gold. So when we look at these objects, the necklace and the ring and the bracelets, we see only bracelet and we see a ring. We don't really see the gold. Can we do that also with people? Can we stop seeing that somebody is white, somebody is black, somebody is short, somebody is tall, can we stop looking at all these distinguishing points and instead treat each other as just human beings? That is already a wonderful development and progress when we are able to do that. To see that we all have the same consciousness in us. It's only our external appearances that distinguish us from each other. Good so far. Anybody would like to make any comments, remarks, questions, doubts? Um, yeah, Radhika ji. Yeah. yeah uh, I wanted to ask one thing related to this. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, like uh, about distinction between uh, race, color, mm -hmm. physical structure. It is like uh, all right. Like mm -hmm. uh, we can say that like 
uh, all is human being yeah. but what about uh, you know personalities mm-hmm. you know like uh, uh, like in our family members also or uh, like in immediate uh, friends or you know like uh, our circle social circle like there may be people like there are people with is so like how do we see through like you know they are also seen as us mm-hmm. uh, from the personality aspects you know like it's like very difficult yes. uh, with, <laughs> related with personalities and characters yeah. <laughs> physically like okay we are all human being like you know tall short short like black white it doesn't matter but like uh, coming uh, through you know like dealing with the personalities of the people yeah. and like thinking we are all same like it is very hard to deal uh, yes. you know, yes. with that aspect so like how do we uh, like take through uh, like how do we see through that like, personality in terms of personality like you know mm-hmm. yes you uh, see it is not the, the it is not very different from the the color example now maybe for you uh, it's not so important if somebody is black or somebody is white but you know for some mm-hmm. people it's very important there are people killing each other about this you know there's so much racism going on uh based on skin color that uh, you might say oh yeah this, this is not a problem <laughs> but for some people they would already say of course it's a problem i don't want uh, you know certain kind of people in my neighborhood living in my neighborhood yeah. you know they have a certain attitude or uh, people judging each other on the basis of appearances on the basis of looks or on the basis of could be education or whatever it may be so what you are saying is merely a more subtle aspect so for you perhaps the skin color does not matter but the personality is only a more subtle version of the skin color you can say that that's the color of the mind you know and um, mm. so some people have a very strict personality for example somebody may be much more relaxed personality some persons may be uh, more fun loving some are very communicative and others are very introverted they don't talk much so you would say oh i like people who are fun loving and talking and communicative I don't like the people who are not very communicative, who are very closed, you know, they, 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 it's not that they don't want to talk, perhaps they, they feel embarrassed or they're nervous. So without passing judgment on the personality, if we would learn to enjoy these different personalities, the variety, uh, that makes the world. Yeah, uh, okay. Like, uh, I need to say, Uh, not like you know uh, in that term but like uh, something like personal uh, which I experienced like mm-hmm. for example uh, in my circle like in my friend circle or social circle like uh, some people when they uh, behave bad with me without reason then like I also feel you know like sad and angry so like how to see through this you know like they are also same as me like it's it's impossible I mean like for me it is like uh, like it's very difficult you know like uh, to see them like uh, as a consciousness as you are seeing in this like paragraph not like talkative or something like that but you know behavior uh, in behavior aspect hmm. you know like uh, like day to day behavior aspect and like uh, so how to see through that yes so i was coming to uh, that this example okay. this verse says thereby he reaches the supreme state which means that is is already referring to someone who is quite developed uh, spiritually and has gone beyond this idea of not only bodies being different but also personalities being different so as i mentioned when you learn to enjoy different personalities and a strict person comes and talks to you in a certain way you will not take it personally anymore you will just find it okay it's it's just his personality it's the different spices of life you know now because you have a samskara yourself which is being affected by a personality outside 
it disturbs you so there is no quick fix for this it's a process of purifying your own samskaras and as you keep purifying your samskaras you will come to that stage where you will also learn to enjoy the personalities the different personalities and you will not take something that somebody says personally even if the person is rude to you you will just be amused by it because it no longer touches you you don't have a handle for that you know so this comment here we must remember that we are already talking about somebody who has experienced a certain um gone through a certain level of development we are talking about a chapter which comes after the kundalini experience and wow. so the person who is bhagavad gita is an amazing text because it actually goes through the entire spiritual path of development of a single person starting with beginning to understand the basic theory beginning to live this out in one's life practicing meditation experiencing kundalini um which means experiencing the universal self learning to distinguish between the real and the non-real or the self and non-self so such a person is already highly developed the idea is not uh, for for us or for you to say okay now how do i see uh, this one in everybody that would become an intellectual exercise okay yeah it happens it has happened i know of some teachers in india who teach it like this they keep uh, they say to their students shout loudly uh, i am pure atman and they have to shout that very loudly and then and these students whenever they go out on the streets they keep looking at everybody and say oh he is also pure atman or she is pure atman he is pure atman everyone is pure atman and that is their practice but what's happening is that they are just telling this to themselves they're trying to hypnotize themselves but they have not had that direct insight where they actually see that these people really are pure atman they're just talking themselves into it you can't talk yourself into it you will only achieve the opposite you will end up suppressing all your samskaras rather than allowing them to surface and to be purified you will achieve only the opposite so when we read the bhagavad gita we have to keep this in mind that at a certain level we are talking about what you will attain or what you should aspire to attain it doesn't mean that you have to imitate that behavior it's not a strategy to lead your life this is explaining what will happen to you in future if you continue to do meditation okay so it's not an instruction okay. it's not an instruction to look at everybody and say this is we are all one and we are all the same that's not a, it's not an instruction it says seeing the lord in everyone equally one does not violate the self by the self and reaches the supreme state so if you are able to do that eventually then you will reach the supreme state okay okay thank you so that that was a very good clarification very useful i hope for everybody as well because this is a common um uh, experience that i've had very often that uh, practitioners very sincere seekers who begin to believe that this is an instruction and that they have to behave like this this is not an instruction of how you should behave this is how it will be if you go through the process systematically so verse 30 he alone sees who sees the self 
as not a doer, and who sees that all acts are performed by Prakriti alone in every way. Once again, this verse elaborates upon the earlier verse and says that when you see direct knowledge or direct experience of the self, then you know that the self is not the doer. Because when you have had that experience of being a witness, a witness doesn't do anything. Witness only witnesses. That's what the word means. And then the witness sees that all acts are performed by Pakruti, by the body, by the field, not by the field knower. This has become, again, very popular among Neo-Advaitites. So everybody keeps saying, I'm not the doer, I'm not the doer. And they try to hypnotize themselves. But they only achieve the opposite, that they go further away from development. They only end up suppressing their true personality. Rather than letting it come forward in an honest and authentic manner. Verses 31 to 34. When he observes the separate being of all beings united in one and all expansion from the very same then he becomes Brahman, being devoid of attributes, the Supreme Self, Paramatman, though dwelling in the body, O son of Kunti, neither acts nor is it tainted by action. Just as the all-pervading sky is not tainted in its subtleness, similarly, this Atman, dwelling everywhere in the body, is not smeared. Just as a single sun illuminates this entire world, so the field knower illuminates the entire field, O descendant of Bharata. Very beautiful verses. They capture the idea of Brahman, that is when you see all these beings as one, all the consciousness of all these as one, that is Brahman. And that, this is a form of expansion. It all expands out of that one Brahman. When you see that, direct knowledge of that, then you have attained. You become Brahman itself. That is, you are established in pure consciousness. Though this pure consciousness has no qualities as such, no attributes, it's dwelling everywhere in this body. And even though it's dwelling in the body, it does not act, nor is it tainted by any action. It's like the sky. It's not tainted at all. So this Atman is everywhere in the body, but it is not tainted. It's like the sun. It illuminates the world. Similarly, consciousness illuminates the body. As we said, without consciousness, this would be only dead matter. It's like the body has only borrowed a bit of light from the field bearer or the body bearer. It has no light really of its own, not much. It has not that same consciousness. It's got that it's just borrowed that light. It's just reflected light. And it gives the appearance of body having life. You are a bit like a puppet. You know the puppet does not really move. Somebody is making it move. And that one who makes it move, that is pure consciousness. And with that, we come to the last verse of this chapter. A very important verse. 
those who does know with the eye of knowledge the difference between the field and the field knower as well as the release from the primordial nature prakriti which is the origin of elements they reach the transcendent jana chakshu that is the eye of knowledge what we discussed that just right now with survey and we said of course we can understand theoretically that everybody is made of this consciousness that everybody has a purusha or atman and yet we get lost and when we get annoyed with somebody's personality we get angry we get upset or we get attached but the one who knows this knowledge with the eye of knowledge he knows the difference between the field and the field knower what is the eye of knowledge do you know the eye of knowledge anybody jana chakshu we all know that between the eyebrows is a chakra and this chakra is known as ajya chakra in english sometimes it's called the third eye and many people say oh this is the chakra of knowledge we need to correct this because ajya is a compound of two which is a and jya jya is knowledge a is a negation that means not knowledge so this chakra ajya chakra that is between the eyebrows is not the chakra of knowledge it is the chakra which is the gate to the gateway of knowledge it's the it's the door and these doors are closed so you have to pierce through this chakra only when you pass through the chakra you come to the chakra of knowledge which is known as jnana chakra or guru chakra the ajya chakra is in fact one of the important granthis that is the the door you can see it as a door or you can see it as a barrier mostly it's an obstacle or a barrier and we are not able to pass beyond this as long as we are not able to pass beyond this we are always in the field of the elements of the five elements and we are lost in these elements the bhutas it's so only when we go beyond through and beyond this chakra that we go to this non dual world and i able to see directly what is meant by all the verses of this chapter before that everything is theoretical only having gone beyond this chakra this third eye or the jan ajya chakra can you understand that these two are different there is the body and there is the the knower there is the field and the field knower there is the experiencer and the experienced and we have a direct insight direct knowledge of that true experience everything else would be theoretical so it says you know only those who know with the eye of knowledge the difference between the field and the field knower they can reach the transcendent so just by saying everybody is atman all this is the world and only there is atman inside you 
this kind of repeated talk is not what will um, get you to that transcendental state but actually experiencing that by passing through the Ajaya Chakra and going to that non-dual state Guru Chakra or Jnana Chakra there you get true knowledge or Paravidya the, the knowledge that is beyond all these worldly things Most people do not know about the Guru Chakra. If you see in most texts or so, it is not mentioned. You will not find it in the standard uh, texts where they will show you the seven chakras. Guru Chakra is not shown there. This is only learned through teacher through traditions like our tradition which is a meditative tradition through direct experience and then handed down knowledge also handed down in the lineage where people are actually practicing and experiencing these things the idea is not to have a theoretical discussion there are many teachers who are having theoretical discussions this, that's the realm of religion. They keep arguing, they keep debating, there are different schools of thought and they keep, you know, fighting with each other, which is superior. Those who are interested in knowing directly, they are not interested in arguing. They are not interested in debating. They are not even interested in, in uh, discussing who is the greater master or who is uh, better. They are very content to do their own practice, attain direct knowledge and then they are very happy to teach those few who are sincerely interested. And that is why we say Natatavyam, Natatavyam, don't impart, don't impart. This knowledge is only given to those few who are willing to do practice, who are willing to meditate and who want to go beyond this worldly knowledge to the knowledge of the other shore and attain the highest, become witnesses. So with that, we come to the end of this very, very uh, intense chapter distinction between the knower and the knowables, the distinction between the field knower and the field. Are there any more comments, uh, remarks, sharing, questions, doubts from anybody? Uh, yeah, one, one thing I want to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, before we, uh, like, you know, reach that state, uh, which uh, you said, like, uh, like, you know, um, that uh, state. So how do we, like, at present moment deal with those feelings, you know, like, uh, by purifying samskaras, like, by meditating, but, uh, like, uh, that is the process, it is a long process to reach there, and uh, during this process, like, how we should deal with those, uh, you know, feelings, like, how should we take it? Like, it happens, and just we, like, if, if I feel anger or uh, sad, or, you know, like, uh, if I don't like somebody, um, like you know uh, doing something to me mm -hmm. so like i just uh, take that feelings and that emotion just as it comes and just let it go or like uh, like what is the way to approach it you know that feelings or you know that mm -hmm. type of emotions yeah emotions are very very powerful when you are in a situation where somebody says survey you're stupid and you get very angry you know, at that moment, you may be lost because your awareness is gone. You get so affected by that. You get so disturbed by this that you're not able to have that awareness to say to yourself, okay, Suri, now just watch your anger. 
if you are able to watch your anger, if you have that much awareness where you can say, Shurvi, just watch your anger. Don't suppress it. Don't shut up and just keep quiet just because you feel uh, I shouldn't talk. Instead, observe your anger. When you start observing the anger, then you will respond differently. If you are lost in the anger, then you will say, I'm not stupid, you are stupid. You know, you will hit back. That is a reaction. And that comes from when that that comment really hurts you somewhere because you have the samskara. Some part of you is not confident. So it hits back. Some expectation has not been met. You had some expectation and you didn't get what you wanted, so you get angry. So because the samskara is there, you are reacting. But if you have enough awareness that you can say, just watch this, Suravi, don't, don't, uh, don't immediately react, just watch. If that much awareness you have, then it's already a big step. If you don't have that awareness okay. and you're lost in the anger or whatever the emotion may be, then fine, you're lost in it. But when you do your meditation, you can contemplate on it with Atma Vichara, Go through that process. Allow that anger to, to come up and you can observe it again and contemplate on it. And then let it go. Very often the word let okay. go is misunderstood. People think let go means suppression. <laughs> oh, I let it go. But they didn't let it go. They just suppressed it. So to distinguish between the two takes some time, takes practice and experience. So that's an ongoing process. So the questions you have asked are very practical, they're very useful, but they also require a lot of practice and time. Both are required. So it's an ongoing process, which you are already doing. I know you're doing a practice, you're doing a great job. So it's an ongoing process. What is required, of course, is a little bit of patience. <laughs> so that's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Good. So we are actually almost done with the one hour. So since we are also done with this chapter, I don't want to start chapter 14 right now. It doesn't quite, you know, make sense to start this chapter. We can then do this next time. And... Um, so we can end over here, unless anybody has any other thoughts, comments. It's all good, everybody else is happy. Then the next time we'll do chapter 14, which is Guna Traya Vibhaga Yoga, the threefold division of gunas. That's a very interesting chapter because it is also a little bit more practical and... Um, one can relate to it more easily than to this. This is a little bit more, this chapter was a little bit more difficult to relate to. But the next session on the gunas are something that we all will be able to relate to. And uh, I hope to give you some <laughs> amusing examples of, uh, of the gunas that will make it more interesting. Good, in that case, everybody, have a nice uh, weekend and see you next Friday, same time, where we'll continue with the chapter 40. Bye, everyone. Goodbye, thank you. Yeah, bye-bye, thank you. Bye, Debbie. Bye, bye Sarvi.